curse people when they disobey him. Which portion of the Bible can give us an accurate picture of, the, of God's true nature and why? So we said from our previous study that Bible study and the Bible contains a figure of speech. Now, I need to explain a little bit of that as well, because when I say figures of speech, um, a, a lot of people sort of get a little bit rascible about it. Now, the reason why they are figures of speech, the statement figures of speech means a style of communicating a language. So let me give you an example of a figure of speech. Proverbs, when we are growing up, our grandmothers and our grandfathers, our uncles and our aunties, after giving us a long lecture on how we should behave in secondary school or how we should behave in the community, would often begin or interspersed or ended with what we call a proverb. In other words, they summarize their entire advice in a way of communication, and we call it proverb. So that proverb contains a bundle of all that our uncle, our aunt, our, our sister, our brother wanted to say. So they are communicating something, but because what they are communicating is so comprehensive, they, they condense it in one sentence. See that? Let me give you one example of a kind of proof that is used. In English, they say that there is dignity in labor. So when they say there's dignity in labor, what they are saying is that any type of labor, so long as it brings income, makes the person who receives the income feel dignified. In other words, at the end of the day, what justifies the means is that I receive salary. Now, let me put that same, let me put that same, there is dignity in labor in French, even though you don't speak French. But I want to show you what I mean by figures of speech. The French put it this way, in n'y a pas de so métier, which means if I'm going to go for word for word translation, it will never mirror the English because in n'y a pas, there is so, S-O-T, which means silly, stupid, métier, profession. So can you imagine, there is dignity in labor. There is no stupidness in profession. It doesn't correlate. It doesn't make sense. However, that is the way the French will put it. And that is the way the English will put it. So when we say figures of speech, it is a mode of communicating. And sometimes in the mode of communicating, you cannot take it word for word. So that means for the Bible to be translated in their two main languages from Hebrew, Old Testament, Greek, New Testament. And even in the day of Jesus, there was a language spoken called Aramaic that means they all have to be subjected in bringing Hebrew to English, in bringing Greek to English, in bringing Aramaic to English. They will have to be subjected to the rules of grammatical interpretations in English. And that makes it all significant. So when we deal with the Bible, there are some terminologies, there are some words, there are some statements. And one of them is what we are dealing with here called the wrath of God. And we have studied and we realized that the wrath of God is not English language wrath of God. We are dealing with a translation problem. We are dealing with, we are dealing with figures of speech. That has been anchored. So we've, done, we've, we've said that. We said it was using the Old Testament. We have used the New Testament. Now, for us to arrive, for us to arrive at this all important topic, the true nature of God in Christ, and to see whether God has any wrath or any anger, and to see whether it was God that did the killings in the Old Testament, then there are some rules of interpretation that must be brought to light. We've dealt with that, I'm just going over it quickly. To let you know that not every word in the Bible carries a literal meaning. That, that is where some of the errors creep up. One, Jesus defines the boundaries of the exact explanation of God's word, because it was Jesus in his earthly work that answered all questions about God the Father. Number two, we have said that the Bible also is a piece of literature because of translation. And because of that, it employs the use of figures of speech, critical. We also said that Jesus laid down a style, a pattern of how the Old Testament must be interpreted and how the New Testament must be interpreted or explained. You realize that, and I'll go into that Bible verse shortly. You realize that after resurrection, after resurrection, Jesus did not use parables anymore. He now spoke in plain speech. We said that in the, in the Old Testament, another figure of speech that Moses in his writings used a lot is what in English is called metonymy. There are many, there are so many figures of speech. Metonymy, parables, imageries, euphemisms, similes, 
onomatopoeia, oxymorons, these are all figures of speech, and they are in the Bible. And as, 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 Bible, as Bible students and believers, you must be aware of them. So Moses used this particular one called metonymy, one word to represent a whole lot of things. One word to represent a whole lot of things. For example, when we say the blood of Jesus, it does not always refer to the liquid homoglobin. It is a metonymy to stand for the life of Christ, the life that he gave. See that? So if you don't look at it in context, you always begin to see the blood of Jesus as liquid hemoglobin, whereas biology even will debunk that. Because even in biology, in medical science, when blood is exposed to oxygen over a few minutes, it becomes contaminated. Very important that we understand that. So we said Moses used this metonymy a lot. And that metonymy example is the wrath of God. And we are still traveling to unpack it. We said also that in translation, they used the writers on the Old Testament and translators used a causative verb in place of a permissive verb. What is a causative verb? A causative verb, like the name suggests, cause, a verb that causes, means that God is the one that caused it directly. But we know that there's a reason to that. Because under the Old Testament, there was no revelation of God. Hebrews chapter 10, verse 1, talks clearly about it. He will say, he talked about the fact that, that under the Old Testament, you know, it was about shadow of figures and outline, but not the true revelation. So when the translators did not, could not understand that because not all translators are born again in their arbitrary choice, and nobody can tax them for that, they used a causative verb in place of a permissive verb. And I gave the example yesterday, an evil spirit from the Lord besought Saul, and David was brought to play the harp. But that cannot be accurate. Because if it is God bringing the evil spirit, he should be the one who determines when the evil spirit should go out. Why would he need David to bring it out? So the writers in the Old Testament, not knowing the true nature of God because of the sixth point, which I'm going to give after this, rendered it as God was the one that caused the evil spirit because they didn't know. The sixth reason why we must be able, through which we can be able to understand this topic is that Satan was hidden in the Old Testament. So now we're going to travel to something which is very, very significant. And I want you to please follow me on this very carefully. Even though I've repeated it, but I want you to see that because that will, that will galvanize and hold the explanation of this whole topic. Now, let me say this before I go to that, as I switch my screens. The Bible is for explanation. The Bible is not meant for show off. The Bible is not meant to quote and show that you know. That is not the purpose of the Bible. The Bible is for explanation. No wonder in Acts chapter 8, Philip was in a crusade and the Spirit of God directed him to go to a place and meet the Ethiopian Enoch. The man was on his chariot going on his way, as it were, on pilgrimage to Jerusalem. Whilst he was in his chariot, the Spirit of God told Philip to hurry up and get closer to the chariot. And the man was reading from the scroll of Isaiah. And he was reading somewhere. He was led to the, he was led to the slaughter like a sheep before its shearers. And he would did not open his mouth. So when he read that, the Ethiopian, you know, this was a very wealthy man from Ethiopia who was in charge of the Candace of Ethiopia, who was an eunuch. Now in those days, eunuchs, because of the fact that they worked within the court of the king, had to be castrated. Oops, excuse me for the word castrate, but that was the reality. So when Philip, I want you to observe something, watch. Philip was in a crusade. I want to show you where God's interest also is apart from salvation. Philip was in a crusade. God knew that this man needed accurate understanding. So when Philip got close to the chariot, the, the eunuch said, who is this man talking about? Is he talking about himself or somebody else? So Philip said, do you understand who you, what you are reading? He said, how can I? Except somebody tells me or explains it to me. Then the Bible says that, from the same verse, and actually the Enoch was reading Isaiah 53. That is all the apostles had from Genesis to Malachi. He said, and he preached Christ unto him. 
take note of the emphasis. He didn't use Isaiah 53 for anything but the target of the scriptures, Christ and him crucified. Now, if God could take Philip from a crusade and bring him so that just this one man will benefit from that revelation knowledge, and afterwards, the spirit of God caught Philip away to Azotus to continue what he's doing to preach in villages, it shows that salvation is twofold. First Timothy chapter two, verse four. For this kind of praying is good and acceptable to all men in the sight of God. Who wills, who wishes, who desires all men to be saved. That is the first part, salvation. When they are saved, there's a part number two. And to come to the recognition of the truth. It's one thing to be saved. It's one thing to come to the recognition of the truth. It is the recognition of the truth that requires explanation. The word truth there, you know, people say, you shall know the truth and the truth shall set you free. That meaning that, you know, if probably I am saying that John, but I said Mark, then I'm not saying the truth. That is not what that statement refers to. Not at all. In context, when the word truth is used, the word truth means reality. You shall know, the word is epignosco. You shall know, you shall be conversant. You shall, be, you shall have a well understanding, a well explanation of the truth, of the reality. What is the meaning of the word reality? The word reality means accomplished fact, a fact that has been already done. And what has already been done, the death, the burial, the resurrection, the ascension, the sitting at the right hand of the Father of Christ. So you shall be conversant, know inside out of what Christ has accomplished. And knowing that makes you walk in the arena of freedom. Not knowing that, Satan will rob you with lies. Can you see that now? So now, for us to travel, I want to, look, I want to look at something because this is an area that is strongly and passionate about it on my heart. And, and this is where I think the church has missed it a little bit. Notice that this is after resurrection. Now let us come to, before we can deal with the wrath of God, where I'm going today, and probably touch on Sodom and Gomorrah, this is an area that has to be clear before we can, we can, we can be able to see it in the light of Christ. After resurrection, notice Jesus, before resurrection, spoke in parables. The word parable is paraboli, P-R-A-B-O-L-E, paraboli. It's a Greek term. The word paraboli means analogy, analogy, allegory. It means that, it means that using something to explain something. And it also means that it is something that is used to people who have of a low spiritual IQ. So let me shock you before I go on. Parables were given to people of low spiritual IQ. They had no spiritual understanding. Why? Because of their spiritual state. What is their spiritual state? They were not born again. So the Bible tells us in 1 Corinthians chapter 2, from verse 40, is that the natural man, the word natural man refers to the man without Christ. The natural man cannot understand the things, the word things, there's pragma. The actions of the spirit. What is the actions of the spirit? Christ and him crucified. For they are spiritually discerned, evaluated, understood. That's what he said. The natural man cannot understand the things of the spirit. Because they are foolishness. They are, un they are unintelligible. He cannot access, assimilate. How can a man who died 2,000 years ago save me how can the sin of adam affect the whole world how can a blood of, a blood of a person that died and spent three days and three nights the, the the unintelligent man in spiritual matters of christ cannot access it so when we are talking therefore in regard to the translation of god's word and, and the interpretation of god's word parables are for people of low spiritual iq because nobody was born again. And in every parable, there is, they, they, they are not literals. There's only one literal parable, Luke 16. All the other parables were not, were not literals. That means they were stories to drive home a point. Observe, every parable has a story. 
It has a fiction. It have a, it has a lesson. It has a fiction. It has a lesson. The mistake we do with the parables is that we stay with the fiction too much. We don't see the lesson or what the person was driving at. So if you study all the parables of Christ, they were all evangelistic. They were pointing to salvation by faith in Christ yet to come. But Jesus used a style of speaking called an heuristic statement, which means that he said it as if it was ready, but it was not ready until Christ resurrected. Because in John chapter 7, verse 40, he said that on the last day of the feast, Jesus rose up and shouted, if any man is thirsty, let him come and drink. For out of his bellies shall flow rivers of living water. For this he spake of the spirit, which was not yet given, for Christ was not yet glorified. Do you see that? Do you see that? So even though Jesus spoke in parables as if it was ready, but it was not ready until it was resurrected, he spoke it by faith in futuristic terms. So Jesus used parables before resurrection. After resurrection, let us see, he didn't use parables. And this, this is the first day after resurrection on the road to Thomas. There's a principle that that is why I'm bringing this and I want you to watch. And then that very day, two of them were going to a village called Emmaus. It's on your screen, which was about seven miles from Jerusalem, verse 14. And they were talking with each other. This is Luke 24. And they were talking with each other about all these things which are taking place, verse 15. While they were talking and discussing it, Jesus himself came up and began walking with them, 16. But their eyes were miraculously prevented from recognizing him, 17. Then Jesus asked them, what are you discussing with one another as you long, walk along? And they stood still, looking brokenhearted, verse 18. One of them called Cleopas and said to him, are you the only stranger? Are you the only stranger? Are you the only stranger? Are you the only stranger visiting Jerusalem who is unaware of the things which have happened here in these recent days? Verse 19, he asks, he asks, what things? And they replied that the things about Jesus of Nazareth, who was a prophet, powerful indeed, and word in the insight of God and all people, 20, and how the chief priests and our rulers handed him over to be sentenced and crucified crucified him, 21, but we were hoping that it was he was going to redeem Israel and set our nation free. Notice, notice, you see where Israel's mind has been all this while? They have been using the Old Testament only to refer to political emancipation. Observe the conversation. Indeed, besides all this, it is the third day since these things happened, 22. And also some of the women among us shocked us. They were at the tomb early in the morning, 23, and they did not find the body. Then they came back saying that they had even seen a vision of angels who said that he was alive. 24, some of those who were with us went to the tomb and found it just exactly as the woman had said, but they did not see him. Watch Jesus' answer. This holds the entire explanation of both the Old and New Testament. Then Jesus said to them, oh, foolish men. Foolish men is not an insult. In the Greek, it is brados, B-R-A-D-U-S. It means slow to catch the meaning of a context. Insipid to fail to see the target of a context. Forlorn to have missed the nucleus of a context. And slow of heart. So there is two words. It is brados cardia, B-R-A-D-U-S, K-A-R-D-I-A, 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 cardia. We get the English derivative, cardiology, heart. It means the innermost part of a man. So you are slow of heart. He's talking about your mindset. What? To trust and believe in everything that the prophets have spoken. So the prophet spoke something. But in reading them, remember, these guys are Jews through and through. They read the Tanakh, the Pentateuch, and, and comprising of the Torah and everything, every Sabbath. But Jesus now said, you guys have missed the whole point. Verse 26, was it not necessary for the Christ, the word there is Christus, which is from the word creo, which is from the word anointed, 
which is from the word, which also has to do with the fact that Messiah, the word Messiah is a derivative, if you go into the Aramaic, of the word Sota. The word Sota means savior. To suffer. When did Jesus suffer? I never remember where he suffered. He's referring to his death burial. The things, and only then to enter his glory, you see English language, I thought that glory is some light, some light, some light. You know, we all, glory of God, glory of God, some light. No, the word glory refers to resurrection. Because the word glory means kabod. Something that has of significant value and weight. Then look at, look at it. Look at verse 27. This is where the principle is. This is where the principle is before I continue. Remember, before resurrection, parables. After resurrection, there's no parabola here. So he's doing something to the Old Testament. That means all the time Jesus used parables to try and bring their mind to the target of the writings of the Old Testament. Then, beginning with Moses, look at how Jesus started teaching the Old Testament. He didn't jump into Isaiah. He didn't jump into Nahum. He didn't jump into Habakkuk. He didn't jump into Joel. Because in everything, you have to start from the beginning. You cannot learn, you cannot, you cannot learn, you cannot learn chemistry. You cannot learn chemistry and all of a sudden jump to kinetic theory. You have to start with the definition. Because the definition will give the consistency of anything else you will learn. Then beginning with Moses and throughout all the writings of the prophets, please notice, this cannot be done in five minutes. This cannot be done in 10 minutes. This cannot be done in one hour. Because if you read down, he was with them till dusk. Then beginning with Moses, the Greek word here is apomoseus, away. Bringing, bringing out and throughout all the writings of the prophets. Watch, keywords, keywords, keywords. He explained and interpreted for them, for him to explain and interpret for them. That means they had been reading it, but they missed the purpose, they missed the target, they missed the content for which the Old Testament was written. He explained, and that word is a Greek word. The word explained and interpreted. The word and is which is. He explained which is interpreted is a Greek word, dia menu. It's two words, dia, D-I-A, menu, H-E-R-M-E-N-E-U-O. From hem, hermenu, we get hermeneutics. Dia means to travel across, to travel across. So that means Jesus traveled across from the writings of Moses, Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, Deuteronomy, and the writings of the prophets, 1 Samuel, 2 Samuel, 1 Kings, 2 Kings, 1 Chronicles, 2 Chronicles, all the way to the minor of them, that is even to Malachi. What did he do with that? I want you to watch something. He explained, he traveled across and interpreted for them the word there is their menu. We get the word hermeneutics. Explained, showing them that for them, the things, the word things there is the Greek word pragma, which means actions. So there were some actions in the Old Testament in the writings of Moses. There were some actions in the writings of the prophets. There were some actions all the way to Malachi, but they were for what? They saw it. In what were those actions? There were stories, there were enactments, there were rituals, there were some things that were done, there were actions. But he said those actions, whether it's the Feast of Tabernacles, the Feast of Weeks, whether it was, whether it was the, the unleavened bread, whatever, all those actions, that story of Abraham and Isaac, all those actions of Noah, all those actions, pragma, he said, he showed them. He said, you guys have missed it, missed it, missed it, missed it, missed it. But after resurrection, now I am ready to tell you what it all means. Referring to himself found in all the scriptures. 
Now, I need to qualify that. Now, so many people hear that they say, every nitty gritty in the, now wait, when he says scriptures, the book of Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, they were not ready. I want you to, Jesus is our model. The books from Acts to Revelation were not collated. Some of the New Testament were being translated from Aramaic or what we call the Septuagint, Hebrew into Greek, but they were not ready. So the word scriptures is pivotal. The word scriptures here refers to context, context, go back. Begin Moses and the writings of the prophets. He explained and interpreted for them found in the scriptures. Jesus, ladies and gentlemen, brothers and sisters, Jesus referred to the writings of Moses, the writings of the prophets. In fact, the entirety of the Old Testament from Genesis to Malachi referred to it as the scriptures. Because the word scripture is graphe. The word there is hero's grammar or hagios graphe. The word graphe is what we get in English word graphic. It has to do with legibles, writings. And he's talking about these writings, they are specific. So the word all is the Greek word peri, P-E-R-I. It does not refer to the fact that everything in Genesis to Malachi is referring to Christ. No, he's saying that when you put it together, it comes out with one unified message, one unified target, one unified explanation, Christ and him crucified. Which means watch, Jesus dropped the story of <laughs> Samson and Delilah is not involved. That means there, were, there was a bias. There was a bias in this traveling. From traveling from Genesis to Malachi, there was a bias. He told them to focus on the things that refer, point to, accentuate himself. He has not finished. These were the two men. This is how the Old Testament is supposed to be explained. So Jesus laid that down. After resurrection. The same day, let's go down. In the evening, the 11 were locked because of persecution. Watch the same. I want to show you the consistency before I deal with today's own. I want to show you the consistency. The 11 were locked in a room. He walked through the doors because he now had a glorified body, the same body you and I will receive on his return, according to Romans chapter 8. He walked through doors without, this, without damaging the door. Then he said to them, 11, minus Judas Iscariot, or Iscariot. Iscariot is not his surname. There were many Judases, but he was the one that had the key to the lock, the locksmith. To separate him from other Judas, he called him the one with the locksmith, the key to the to the to the money bag. No wonder he was the pilferer. Then he said to them, "This is what I told you. I told you. I told you. I told you. I was saying it in parables. I was saying it in typologies. I was saying it in proverbs. I was saying it in images. You guys did not catch it. That is why in the book of John he said that I have John sixteen. I have many things I want to say to you." but you cannot bear them now. Why? Their spiritual capacity was darkness because nobody was born again yet until Christ rose from the dead. Salvation is light. Psalm 27, the Lord is my light and my salvation. How about I? The Lord is my light and which is salvation. Salvation brings light. For the light that lighted up the whole world has come, John chapter one. So when you're not born again, you are called darkness. Because you cannot perceive, you cannot perceive, you can't understand the message. So this is what I told you while I was still with you. Everything which has been, has been, has been, has been written. What is the essence about me in the law of Moses? Uh oh, but when you go into the law of Moses, will you see J-E-S-U-S -S that is going to die? No, it was hidden. It was obscured from their understanding. Not He didn't hide it. It was their state of the fallen Adam. In the law of Moses, watch, and the writings of the prophets, watch, and the Psalms, 
must be fulfilled. So for something be, to be fulfilled, it means that before it was fulfilled, it was a promise. So he's letting us know that the Old Testament, the entire hegemony of it are promises and prophecies about what he just did by resurrection. Then verse 25, watch, I need to do this. Then he opened. Now that word opened is the first time this word was used in the Greek lexicon. The word is dialogue He opened their minds to help them understand. That word is tsunami. We get the word tsunesis. Comprehensive insight. Look at the same word again. The scriptures. Genesis to Malachi. And said, for this, and so it is written that the Christ, the Messiah, the anointed one would suffer. Would you see it clearly in the Old Testament? So he's saying that we have missed it. Abraham and Isaac is not about money, it's about Christ. The story of Joseph is about Christ. Her. These are Jews. The moment it is made to refer to a particular individual other than Christ, it brings deficiency. Watch it. Let me explain to you. Look at the story of Joseph. Let me give you an example. And you can accept it or not accept it. The moment you make the story of Joseph personal, you have disadvantaged another believer. You make the other believer feel like he's not up to the task. You are going to come out of your prison. You are Joseph. Wait, what about if he never comes out? See that? You see how it, it places somebody at a disadvantage? It, uh, it makes somebody feel like that he has a superior advantage over the other believer. But when it is seen in Christ, then it's a level playing ground. Glory to God. That means everybody can do it. Everybody has access to it. Everybody is not disadvantaged because in Christ, in him, there is no male, no female, barbarian, no skytian. None. Level playing ground. And he said, and so it is written that the Christ would suffer. So what did he do again? He explained to us the purpose of the Old Testament, how it should be explained, how it should be ended. And the key word there is beginning at Moses. So now in dealing with the wrath of God, now I'm going to go into that now. You have to use the same principle that Jesus left to the disciples. This is how the apostles interpreted the word of God. This is how they did it. This is the first Bible school, the true one, the paradigm, the model. This is what they call Jesus' doctrine. The word doctrine is the word didascalia. It means explanation. How the master explained or debunked or decoded or deciphered or opened how the Old Testament. That means the Old Testament until now, everybody was doing it their own way. But Christ brought order and decorum to it. That guys, this is how it's supposed to be done. You have to start with the writings of Moses. So in tracing the wrath of God, how do you do it practically? Any subject, vengeance, anger, killings, sin, beginning at Moses. So you need to go back into Moses' writers. And what? And where do you start from? The book of Genesis. That is the style. That's the one he's showing them. So in Genesis, you have to ask yourself the question. Before, you have to now take a look at two, two kinds of styles or dividing line. Before the fall and after the fall. So ask yourself, did God, was God angry from Genesis 1 to 3? No. So let us go there. We are using Jesus' style. Beginning at Moses. Yesterday we said that the first time the word anger was used was in Genesis 4. So there's a rule of interpretation called the law of first mention. For you to understand any word, you have to go by what interpreters, Bible translators call the law of first mention. 
when a word was first used in the Bible, will give us a clear understanding of its usage in context, even though there is no omnibus application to the word of God. When I say omnibus, one word cannot mean the same thing everywhere. Context will let us know what the word is saying. But by and large, the principle remains the same. The first time the word rat was used was in Genesis 4. The first time it was used. Genesis 4, 5. But for Cain and his offering, he had, he had no respect. So Cain became extremely angry, indignant. The King James says, wrath. And he looked annoyed and hosta was the first time that word was used. And it was never used with God. So now this, this is something I want to say here. You can accept it. You can, you can, you can leave it. That's entirely up to you. And let us walk in love. Watch carefully now. Watch carefully now. So when you come across this principle and something seems to contradict it, the question you must ask yourself is that, then it might either be a translation problem, a language problem, or it is not clear in my understanding, for there are no contradictions in the Bible. Contradictions exist in the mind of the reader. So a major reason, so the question to ask now is, did God do it? Was God the one that did all these killings? Was God the one that got angry? A major reason for the incorrect representation of what God did under, in the understanding of men is more often than not built on improper interpretation of the Old Testament text of the Bible. I've been saying this. That's why Jesus started with the Old Testament because the Old Testament is the source of humongous confusion in Bible interpretation because it has a style and many are not schooled in that. So the reason for us not understanding because it is built on improper interpretation of Old Testament texts of the Bible, which has created the dilemma that if God's actions are inferred in different kinds of actions, he certainly must be in reality. It is thus so essential to examine the scriptures further, the events, the actors, the outcomes, and the consequences of the actions, the role of God in justice and judgment, which helps us to arrive at a conclusion of what God did or did not do. So for so many years, and I was guilty of that, our problem we've been doing is that I always say this, you watch, watch yourself. We have been taking Bible verses in isolation. We have been taking Bible verses in isolation. Now, let me ask you a question for those, and I'm not trying to bring anybody down. At school, when we're writing essay, especially from year nine, which is secondary school in Ghana, form three, when you are writing an essay, they ask you to reference your work. You cannot write about Mansamusa or any other topic and all of a sudden they ask you the question and you just jump into the middle. No, you have to have a style. You start with your introduction. After your introduction, you now come to the reason why you are writing. After the reason why you are writing, now you come to the body of the text. Now, now in the body of the text, you are now making your assertions pro and con, contra, against. Then in all, when you finish it, you in, in your pro and cons, you give examples, 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 examples to corroborate or show up your fact. Then you come to a conclusion. then you come to a conclusion. But what we have been doing, why we can't understand this seemingly all important talk about the wrath of God, that everybody is just speaking. The moment you talk about, you know, God has no wrath, God has no, ah, wait, but what about Sodom and Gomorrah? What about this? What about that? You see what we are, you see what we are doing? We are jumping. We are, not, we are not considering it as a wholesome, holistic approach. And that's what Jesus meant in that Luke 24. He said, you are cherry picking. You have not considered it from the start. You have to consider it holistically. So the Bible says that in the last days, many shall not endure sound doctrine. The word sound is a Greek word, hugaino, holistic. That's why teaching is not rushed. Preaching is not rushed. You must be holistic. And at the same time, there's some logic also involved to some extent. So the reason why we see the wrath of God 
I said we are dealing with language and translation. So the wrath of God, you have to ask yourself a question. Wait, was in the beginning, did God have anger? No. Where did anger come from? Cain. Where did it come from? The fall. There was no anger in God. When Adam and Eve missed it, he didn't show anger. Even with Cain, he didn't show anger. So that means that the, the intelligent question to ask is that then there must be something wrong with either the language, the language structure, or the mindset of the writers or translators, or we are dealing with figures of speech. See, that is the plausible approach. Now we are thinking. But to dismiss it outright, you are not ready to learn. Then you are, you are, you, you are not ready to learn. You are unteachable. And no matter how you jump up and down, will not change the facts. So let us be pragmatic and follow. So let's go back to our no one john 1 80 no one has seen god his essence his divine nature at any time the one and only begotten god this is the unique son who is in the intimate presence of the father he has explained him already explained his past tense and interpreted and revealed the awesome wonder of the father jesus has already done that it means that to see the actual nature of god is in christ So if there's something which is in the Old Testament, which is at variance with this, it requires proper explanation. And that's what we are doing. See that? Because if Jesus and the Father are the one and the same person, and Jesus is God expressing, explaining himself to man and correcting their wrong perception about man in everything he did, he never killed anybody, never slapped anybody. Never insulted anybody. Though he used brood of vipers, it was not an insult. He was describing their state. See, and, see, and the thing is that in even this, if a person, you, there's, there's something in Bible interpretation called exegesis and I see Jesus. I see Jesus is the fact that you have your own mindset. See, you are stuck to it. So when you are reading the Bible, you read your own mind into it. You don't, let, you don't know that the Bible has got its own mind. That's, that's true humility. True humility is that, you know what? I'm not going in with my own mind. Let me drop this in my mind. Let the Bible bring it out. That Bible bringing out what is already there is exegesis. You putting your own mind in it is eisegesis. The Bible said that for no part of the scriptures came about by one's own private interpretation. The moment you take, you, you, you do it. The moment you take a Bible verse out of entire setting, it will take a meaning of its own outside its context. I'm very careful about that. You have to stay in context. So we said that Jesus is the, has explained God already. So then our main Bible verse again, Malachi 3.6. He said, I am the Lord, I do not change. So the question here now is that, is this change intrinsic nature or is it a change as subject to external influence because some people have this same idea yeah you see god god is god 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 is sovereign he can do whatever he likes that is where we go wrong because the word sovereignty has to be defined god's sovereignty is seen in christ i've exalted my word above my name his word is Christ. The word became flesh. God will not do anything outside Christ. <laughs> See, the moment you want to think, of, then you now want to over-spiritualize. God will not do anything that Christ did not do. So, the I do not change. Is it intrinsic? Or is it external? Because some people have this idea that God is God. You know, he had the anger inside him, but he was holding it. So we are going to examine some Bible verses. Once again, don't forget what I said. We are dealing with language and translation problems. So let's move on. We said that Job, at the end of his, of his entire talkings, said that I only knew of you by the hearing of the ear. So at Job 42, 
he himself admitted that all the things that he said about God, Job 42, 5, 6, I had heard of you only by the hearing of the ear, but now my spiritual eye see you, verse 6, therefore I retract my words. In other words, cancel out all the things I said about God irrationally from Job chapter 1 to chapter 41. He said, I only knew of you by the hearing. He said the word hearing means rumor, superstitions, personal evaluations. <laughs> this, this is a serious matter. It's a very serious matter. So that means that the, this in itself shows you that the Old Testament people didn't have a, a complete picture of God. They didn't have it. Hence, the reason why they said some things, the reason why they wrote some things, even they even accepted that God said it. It was their own impression. Okay, let me take another one. Let's take one. Before that, James 1.5. This is the message of God's promised revelation. When you talk about promised revelation, that means spoken in the scriptures, Old Testament, which we have heard from him and now announced to you that God is light. He's holy. His message is truthful. He is perfect in righteousness. And in him, there is no darkness at all, which refers to no sin nature, no wickedness, no imperfection. Okay, so let us come to a statement like that. Let's come to Isaiah 54. Now we are coming to deal now with the nitty gritty. I'm now, now we have entered the place now. And we shall continue for Monday. But now we have entered. I've brought you along this journey. So we don't have to go backwards. So now we are coming to deal with statements that deal with wrath, anger, wrath, anger, wrath, anger. And find out that was it God who was angry? Was it God who said he was angry? Was it the writer's impression? Is it a language impression? Is it a translation impression? If, beginning at Moses, we didn't see anger at all. It's not, it's not part of his makeup. We said, I am the Lord, I do not change. The Greek word is Shana. I don't have duplicity. I don't have the other side. Okay, let's do, let's do this. Isaiah 54, 7. I want you to watch language. For a brief moment, I abandoned you. But with great compassion and mercy, I'll gather you to myself again. <laughs> Eight. In, uh, 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 in an outburst of wrath, I hid my face from, from you for a moment. But with everlasting kindness, I'll have compassion on you. Just don't you see that this thing, the whole thing just looks, the whole thing looks like somebody who is schizophrenic. Huh? Let me deal with that. Let me deal with that. In what? In an outburst of wrath? That means he's not under control. It means he's not under, Do you understand the word outburst? You were influenced. You were influenced. You had no control. So God is out of control. <laughs> God is out. no no you know me I'm not, I'm not forcing this thing on you I want us to reason he said come let us reason together and state the case for your innocence we are like in a law court remember in law it's a law and precedent even the person has made that you saw him take the knife but the judge cannot say it because he has no circumstantial evidence so in law we have the defending lawyer and we have the prosecuting lawyer and then they bring evidence and the judge will have to wait. So I want us to do that with our thinking caps on before I close. Anger means you have no control. Anger is a process for 
him to be in outbursts of anger, it also means he did not know that they were going to behave like this. I did not know that I was driving, minding my business, looking in my mirrors. And when I checked my mirrors, there were no cars. So I continued. All of a sudden, from nowhere, somebody comes and cuts in, right? Look, I react. Why? Because I didn't see it coming. So like the pastor who somebody crossed him at the traffic light and he was ready, going to ready to preach with his, all his time. <laughs> and he said, as for this one, I will not leave it to go. He got out of his car, slammed the door, went to the other man's car and knocked on the mirror. Bang, 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 bang. Bring it down. Let us see who is a man. When the man wrote the thing that it was a family, not knowing the family were his church members. Then they said, oh, pastor. He was about to fire. Then he held himself. You see? Reaction. So to say in an outburst of wrath, I hid my face for you for a moment, but with everlasting kindness, I have compassion. It looks like tautology here. Says the Redeemer. Look at it, verse 9. I'll we'll come to that. I'll deal more with this on Monday. For this is like the waters of Noah to me, as I swore an oath that the waters of Noah, we are dealing with technical words now, will not flood the earth again. In the same way, I've sworn that I'll not be, I can't even say, it. I'll not be angry with you, nor will I rebuke you. There's something wrong with that structure. There's something wrong with that structure. Can you not see? In an outburst of wrath, I've sworn I'll not be angry with you. Those two words, no, I rebuke you. Something's wrong. That is why I said, steady to show yourself approved. Once again, ladies and gentlemen, if you take Bible verses in isolation without context, you see what I'm doing now? We have not even looked at Isaiah chapter one. We have not looked at the purpose of the book of Isaiah. We have not looked at the images of Isaiah. We have not even looked at what happened before we came to Isaiah 45. We have not looked at the history between, of Israel between, between Isaiah 45. We have not also looked at it in the key one what Jesus said concerning me. Then you can see a verse like this. And with that reservation whatsoever, you jump to conclusion and say, ah, Pastor Fred, it is written there in black and white. The next question I will ask you, have you read it all? Have you considered the pretext? Have you considered the post-text? Have you considered the language? Have you considered the syntax, the semantics? Have you considered it in the way that Jesus taught concerning me? And I'll end here for today and we shall continue next week. As we get, I'm taking you closer. You see, I'm taking, because so everybody's spiritual capacity is at a different level. So I cannot just push it like that. I have to build you slowly. So by the time we come to Sodom and Gomorrah, Noah's Ark, you can use that as a prism to accurately interpret everything in the light of Christ. So we don't jump to conclusion. No. We don't rush Bible study. No. In Jesus' name, I call you blessed always. Amen. Any question quickly? That's normally today would have been our question and answer. Are we there? Hallelujah. Amen. Sister Ruth, bless you. Amen. I like your I like I like your giggling. What's up? <laughs> <laughs> Thank you so much. For bless you. Bless you. Our opening our eyes, you know. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. And giving us more insight. Every day we're learning something new and adding to what we have already. That's right. I give God the glory. Hallelujah. Just to add to what you just said this morning when i was coming to work a lady joined a pregnant lady joined the bus and i think she was feeling hot another lady who was already on the bus before she joined was feeling cold so she closed the window and then this pregnant woman said can you open the window to let in fresh air because there's corona 
And the lady said, I'm cold. She said, I am feeling cold. So it was going to, I mean, the pregnant woman was getting upset. I think she's about five months old pregnant. So the stomach is not showing up properly. And then I said to her, there's a window over your head. So why don't you open that one to give you the fresh air you want so that the lady can close her one because she's feeling cold. She said, but she should know that it's Corona and we need air, 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 air. And it was a hot one. Now the pregnant woman said, God will punish this lady, you know, because she's a demon coming to torment her on the bus. And if she, her mission is to come to torment her, then she's going to deal with her on her altar. Hey, <laughs> the lady who was already on the bus before this pregnant woman joined said, that demon that you are calling me today is you. I reverse everything back to you. And she said, you don't know. You are dealing with a child of God, blah, 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 blah. For a long story to be cut short, I now intervened because it was getting hot with this pregnant woman, cursing and cursing and saying that when I go home, I'm going to tie my hair and deal with you. You're going to die, blah, blah, blah. God, my God will kill you. And I said to her, my dear, if you claim you're a child of God, then I am here to tell you that God doesn't kill. So when you go home to do whatever you want to do on your altar, in the name of God, it won't work because God doesn't kill. 